Starting the stream. Good morning. I've been very lucky in getting the transcoder every single time, except for the first stream last week. Um, so once again, here we are. I think this is the seventh or eighth. I think this is the eighth stream in this series where I'm playing around with uh, graphics and physics engines. So we're drawing with WGPU, this uh, 3D scene, which is sort of like a bare bones Hello World scene. Uh, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on. Okay, sorry about that. That was um, an interrupt. You guys know what an interrupt is? Usually uh, these days they're called hardware interrupts. They're when you're doing one thing, then you get a signal to the CPU that says, hey, whatever you're doing, stop it right now because you got to do this other thing. It's higher priority. Then when you're done, you can return exactly to where you were. <laughs> Good morning, homemade apple pie. Z. And Dr. Padawan, hi. Yeah, so I'm just playing around with graphics libraries and user interface libraries and physics engines and Rust just, just because I want to learn a little bit more about them. Um, the WGPU library we're using to do the 3D graphics is kind of neat because it's a, a, effectively a cross graphics library adapter. So programming the graphics API once, it will work no matter if you're using OpenGL, Vulkan, Metal, WebGL. So I don't have to like learn each of those individual graphics libraries. I can just use one and it should run everywhere. So in general, like I'm running this on a Linux virtual machine. Um, after the stream, I usually just copy it back to my Mac and my Mac runs it on Metal just fine with no problems. There's one, one place where it had a problem and that was because the color space is supported by OpenGL in the virtual machine and Metal on uh, the Mac were um, not exactly the same in capabilities. So I had to fix that. Uh, why does it say I have a... Did I, oh, I accidentally hit the S key on the screen. Yeah, so a little quick rundown of uh, what this um, sort of playground app is doing. It starts all in main. Good morning. C Dev Alraj. Sorry, I'm butchering the name. So everything starts in main. So this is Rust. That's why it looks kind of funny. But even if you don't know Rust, if you know another language like C, C Sharp, JavaScript, some of it might make a little bit of intuitive sense to you. So start in the main function. We're going to return an anyhow result. Anyhow is a library that helps us make uh, convenient ad hoc result types. A result type is like a um, expected in C++, so it's it can either hold a successful result or it can hold an error. So every time you see a question mark here, that means we're taking something that could fail, in other words, fallible function call. If it, if it fails, we get an error and we're converting it to hold um, to, to an anyhow result type so that the error can be reported. And I'm not doing anything other than like just returning it from main. Um, the convention in Rust is that if you return a result and the result is an error in Rust, it gets nicely printed in the terminal after, uh, right before your program terminates. Good day. Sure, yeah. I, I try to pronounce people's uh, chat names, but I probably am not doing a very good job. You were Lycan. Lycan was much easier to say. <laughs> okay, so the contents of what we're doing in this main in order to draw this, right? See how fast I can describe this. So first we're setting up the logging, which you see in the terminal here. That's just giving debug information. Then we're parsing our command line arguments. Right now I'm not passing any, but if I, if I did, I'm allowed to pass one of uh, two things, either this word or this word which selects dynamically at runtime between two different backend window integration layers. 
So one is called wnit, the other is called full tick. And um, they both implement a common interface, which I defined here. So this is how the rest of the program talks to like the window manager and does things like runs the window event loop, uh, gets the size of the window, creates a um, drawable area in the window for the graphics, that kind of thing. So um, we're also creating a context for eGUI. eGUI is the library which allows us to draw like user interface elements like buttons, labels, spinner that we're just toying around with before, right? So that context will go into the app along with the window that we created, the window abstraction. And then um, this app then is um, vends out boxed closures, which the event loop can call whenever it wants the window to be redrawn or when the window gets resized. That's essentially how um, the very top level, how the program's structured. Um, it's all the fun stuff happens in the event loop and most of it happens in redraw. I think the reason you changed it is you wanted it to be the same as your GitHub. Oh, is it, it's easier to change it in uh, Twitch than in GitHub. Hey there, Stripe Monkey. Hello to you as well. All right, so the um, redraw is where most of the fun stuff happens. So this got restructured in the last few streams uh, to be a little bit easier to read, hopefully. So redraw and resize are functions of the app, but um, they are kind of like factories. They generate dynamic on the heap function objects. That's what this is. Box means that the ob uh, it's a value on the heap, so it's dynamically allocated. DYN keyword means that the actual type of the thing on, in this case, on the heap isn't known at compile time, but it's one of many types, uh, whatever, whatever type it is, has to implement this particular interface. Interfaces in Rust are called traits. So there's a trait called FNMUT, which means that it's a function object which uh, can change internally. So it's mutable, a mutable function. You can call it more than once and it can have different behavior over time because it's allowed to change itself. And the function returns a duration value. Uh, the reason it does here is that um, we need that value that the um, redraw returns uh, to go back to the event loop to say uh, when we when when we should draw next time. So this is if you want to do like lazy drawing, like instead of drawing at a regular frame rate, you only want to draw when something actually changes. Um, the, uh, the this time that's returned tells it like the minimum time to wait before drawing again. So it could be right away, or it could be like the next frame, or it could be um, forever because nothing needs to be redrawn again. Can I ask how many days have been into the WG? About seven or eight days. So the vo there's VODs on Twitch that go back seven days. I think the first day is now deleted, but I export all of these to my YouTube channel. So if you wanted to browse through the uh, videos that, um, the, 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 like the very first stream, you can see where I started at. You can go there and find it. I haven't made a playlist yet. I don't expect people to actually watch recorded VODs, but they're there if someone wants to, like if they miss a day or they want to pretend that they're live, even though they've missed it. Um, but uh, um, yeah, again, I don't expect anyone to watch it. I didn't actually start from scratch in this one. I, I did a little bit before streaming to make sure that like I wasn't going to hit a, a dead end. Um, so I had like... I was drawing just a triangle and I had the eGUI drawing something, but it wasn't interactive yet. Okay, so it's a little bit complicated how we make a factory of functions on the heap, function objects. You do look up my VODs, which you missed live. Oh, thank you, Dr. Padawan. Um, the disadvantage of the VODs is you can't interact, which I think is kind of sad, but that's that's okay. But you can also also skip around and play it at 2x or 3x speed like Adam likes to do. So there's the advantage there. So how do we make a function object dynamically typed that's on the heap? Well, I'm glad you asked. So box new is a general way you can take a value and move it onto the heap. And then to make a dynamically typed function, one convenient way is to define a closure. So it's like a um, anonymous function, a lambda function, they're all, they're all similar 
names for the basically the same concept. We're making an anonymous function type that um, captures some of its environment. Um, and the move keyword in front means not only capture by, don't capture by value, try to capture, um, sorry, the other way around. Instead of capturing by, by borrowing a reference to the, to the context around it, actually take ownership. So we're using like app start and info overlay and wrapper. So those all get like absorbed into this closure, even though they're declared outside, right? They're de wrappers declared here. These two are declared there. They move into this closure so that this closure can be called more than once and it retains state like the wrapper app start and info overlay are state that it retains. And because we're allowed to mutate the function, we can um, operate mutably on some of that state. So like the info overlay changes over time and the app changes over time, which is very important because let me show you what the over info overlay is. This is how we describe in eGUI the user interface elements like those labels and buttons. And we can um, also have our own state. So that's why um, we have a mutable self-reference. And in this case, my state has like the um, FPS that we want to draw the account of how many times you press the button so that when you press the button, we actually add one to that count. And we use that count down here in this label. So that's how we're able to um, retain this, the state of the, that number. Even though every frame that we redraw, we're recreating the entire UI structure, it retains the information about how many times he clicked. It doesn't go back to zero every time we re redraw, for example. So why am I making a factory that returns the function rather than just having redraw have this code directly? It's because we have to return we have to take a function and give it to um, an interface. This event loop is part of a trait. So the actual, there are actually more than one implementation of event loop, right? And um, also we don't want to redraw immediately when the event loop starts. We want to redraw only when the event loop says we should. Uh, I'm accidentally tapping keys and it's causing me to change things. Okay, there we go. So let me show you an, uh, one of the implementations of the event loop. So it's the w, w init version of the event loop. So it gets this redraw function, which it needs to hold on to and call later. Um, so where it actually gets, where it redraw actually gets called is right here, this redraw call. By the way, do you see these underlines? So the way I have my editor set up, whenever you see something with a line under it, it means it's a mutable object. It can, its value can change. If you don't see a line under it, it means it's a constant. So constants we declare in Rust with the let keyword. Mutable variables we declare with let mut or let mutable. In other languages, you might say var instead, which would be kind of more concise, but in Rust's case, it's two keywords in a row. So that's if you're if you're wondering why there's lines under certain things, solid blue lines in this case, it's because they are mutable. So this reminds me that redraw is a function which has state in it. It's mutable or it has changeable state. So every time we call it, we can expect that something might change. So like the example I talked about a little bit ago, one thing that can change is that count number that shows up on the screen here. Um, oops, I guess I accidentally changed something that has to compile again. Wait for the goodbye. Yeah, so this number is contained within this redraw function, which is kind of weird when you think about it, but it's because the redraw is a function object, so it's a function with some state. Um, normally, you don't see a line underneath a um, function. Um, you'll see a line under a variable. Um, anyway. Actually, that's not true because the set weight also has a line under it. I think there's also there's a line under function calls whenever the self is a mutable reference in general. So you could have like a mutable object but call an immutable function. Once again, if I say mutable or immutable, it means either it's writable or it's constant. Variable or constant. Mutable means variable. Immutable means constant. 
All right. So um, the event loop is a little bit funky because there are many different kinds of events that can happen. So most user interfaces on computers are event loop style, and a lot of games are too. And what that means literally is, is there is a loop which runs, so a code that keeps running over and over and over again. And it um, every time it runs, it's handling something that changed in the program. It could be that you move the mouse. It could mean that you clicked a button or hit a key on the keyboard or some kind of timer expired. Whatever it is, we get whatever that event that happened. And um, with matches is like a switch and see where we're going to take um, the event and which whatever pattern it matches, we're going to run that code. So if it's a redraw requested event, we're going to redraw the screen and do some other stuff. If it's a window event, and the window event is that the window got resized, we're going to call a resize function. So there's some other details here, like request redraw. Um, with w in it, you, your window doesn't automatically get redrawn when other kinds of events fire. You have to kindly ask the um, you have to ask the window to kindly redraw itself. So this triggers another event called redraw requested. Um, uh, one reason why you want to do it this way is because there, this way there's only one place where we have to call redraw. And so the responsibility of redrawing is in one place only, which is very important in software design called the single responsibility principle, um, I think. Or I, sometimes I get it confused with one of the other principles. But suffice to say, there is a principle in software and architecture that um, when there is something that needs to be done, there should be only one place in your code responsible to do it. So in the case of redrawing, it's the handling of the redraw requested event. Even though we know when our window is resized that we're going to need to redraw because the size changed, we don't call redraw here directly. We just, we call a function to request that it be redrawn and the actual work to do the redrawing happens when that comes back around as, as another event. Uh, some other random things are, um, I'm, um, instant now is a way in Rust to read the clock. So we get a, a clock value and we can use that clock value later um, I don't think I'm using it later. I'm just comparing it to other times here, but you can use it later to like time how long something takes. I think I do that inside of redraw. So let's show that. Yeah, so when we ever we, we redraw at the beginning, I read the clock and then near the end, I read the clock again. Instead of calling instant now, we take the instant that we recorded and call elapsed on it. And that tells us how much time has elapsed since we created the thing. And I'm using that to um, measure how long it actually takes to render. And um, that runs through an averaging window, which and that generates this number, right, which helped me learn that when I move the mouse a lot, and we're generating a lot of extra window events, not only does our frame rate go up, because we're doing some extra redraws because of that, but also the rendering time generally goes up. And I'm not I'm not actually sure why, but it's an interesting observation to me. Okay, hopefully that gives you like a taste of what this program does. Um, so, winit is one library that, uh, what's the best place to show it? It gives us things like the uh, a concrete type for the window, concrete type for the event loop, that kind of thing. eGUI is, library that handles those user interface elements, but it has no, no idea about how to draw them. It just gives you like, here are some textures and some triangles, you know, draw it however you want. And um, you have to integrate these pieces together. So WGPU, WNIT, eGUI have to be integrated together. So there are integration libraries out there, like um, W or eGUI WNIT is the integration between those two libraries. And then there's an eGUI uh, WGPU, which integrates those two. I think so too, homemade apple pies. It can also be an ugly language. So like a lot of languages, you can end up writing ugly code or you can write beautiful code. I think the difference between that is either you have someone who is really skilled at programming and can make beautiful code first try, or like me, um, you start off with ugly code and then you refactor it to, until you, it looks more pretty. <laughs>
Um, okay. So let's get into actual some work today. Uh, what I was at the end of last stream doing was uh, working with um, the draw order. So to illustrate a problem, see how um, this scene, you can kind of intuitively reason that the blue is a, is a sky background. The green is like the grassy ground in this uh, very low poly virtual world. And this colorful sphere is some object that's moving in space. It's slowly rotating, right? So I had the problem the other day that um, because of how I, re I refactored how those objects are rendered on the screen, and it ended up looking strange. Let me show you how it looked. Um, I could do that just by going to uh, where we render. Uh, not in the render. Uh, where would it be again? In the app? draw models i think yeah so if i um comment that out i'll show you the original problem hopefully this actually illustrates the problem if this doesn't i have another idea about how to illustrate it here it is so this can happen if um you draw graphics badly <laughs> it's the example of an amusing bug we have a cube that should show up on top of the ground, but somehow it shows up behind the ground. That's because we drew the cube and then we drew the dr ground and we ignored the fact that we'd already drawn the cube. Um, we just overdrew it. So it's an example of, um, uh, there's a term for it, but like getting the draw order wrong or, getting, or, or ignoring the depth. So the way I solved it first was to correct the draw order so that we drew the background first, the ground, and then drew the cube on top of it. And that was through some rather complicated work where we um, took all of the um, models in our um, app and we um, iterated through them to get the types and the instances. And then we iterated through all the instances. And then we constructed these batches where a batch is all of the instances for a model with a certain draw order. Right, so we, we arranged all of that. Then we sorted the batches, and sorting in Rust uses the ORD and partial ORD trade implementations to determine the ordering. So we're using the draw order compared to the other draw order of given two objects to define how to sort. Right, you could sort any way you want. In this case, I decided the draw order because that's what we want to do. Right, so it's sorting by draw order. And then iterating through all those batches for each batch we call draw on our model render, given the model and the instances in that batch, right? So that solves the problem one way in that um, if you order things from back to front, you won't see those weird unexpected overlaps. Uh, but we still have a problem where Let's say you have um, some more complicated geometry where part of the object is in front of the other, but other parts are behind, like maybe they're curved around each other. The draw order here won't help us because either way we draw one first or the other first, part of it's going to be overdrawn incorrectly. So a more like correct way to, to draw is to use what's called a depth buffer where the... Um, distance for every pixel from the camera to the actual object, that distance is actually recorded in a special texture that is used when you draw future objects into the same scene so that we only draw a pixel if it's in front of what we drew there previously. If it's behind, then we just drop it. Hey there, I got raided by Togglebit. Hello, fine people. I'm probably not as entertaining as Togglebit, but I hope you enjoy. Can we for Unity support web GPU? Cool. That would be nice. Enjoy your food, toggle bit. Thank you for the raid. Sorry, it took me a little bit to notice the raid, but I, you know, I get into things, and I the chat window's over there. You guys are over there, and you guys are more important. <laughs> the chat. Wait a minute. I just uh, said you're more important than than yourselves. The, the pre presenting the stream sometimes I get focused on that, and then I forget to see the feedback. Oh, uh, well, I aspire to be a teacher, Gavin's awful stream. And I, I, 
I assume that when you stream, your streams aren't actually awful. It's just a, it's just a humorous take on it. Uh, I don't like math so much. I, I hope that I come across as a uh, graphics teacher. What are we cooking? We're cooking this playful um, playground. Basically, I am learning some graphics libraries in Rust, and I am um, sharing that learning experience with you guys. Non-existent to be, have, to be honest. Talk of it is the most humorous streamer out there, I think. Well, I'm biased, but... I aspire to be as entertaining as Togglebit, but uh, I also know that I need to be myself, otherwise it becomes too stressful, so uh, I try my best. So yeah, I am sort of playing with multiple libraries here. We're using WGPU to draw 3D graphics, and this is the Hello World. Either you want to draw a triangle or you want to draw a cube that spins. I mean, come on. When you're learning a library to do graphics, it's one of those two, right? So I started with the triangle, I graduated to the 3D cube, and I guess the next step after that is to play with textures. But first I needed to get the depth buffer, the depth uh, drawing correct. And that was what I was in the middle of explaining. This other stuff to the side, I'm not drawing that uh, from scratch. I'm using a library called eGUI. And so that means we have multiple libraries that have different responsibilities and we have to integrate them. So throughout my code, you're gonna see examples of that. For example, if I go back enough, I keep going back. Yeah, when you see things like eGUI context, that's specifically eGUI only. It has nothing to do with WGPU, right? It has nothing to do with wInit, which is our window backend. But when you see the words smashed together like this eGUI wInit, that's from an integration library, a library specifically designed to integrate two different things, in this case eGUI and wInit. So my program's got a lot of a mixture of types directly from foundational libraries and types from integration libraries. And um, so we, we are building upon that to make our own integration, which is this abomination. <laughs> Official hair needs to extend more towards the center of the earth. I know, I've been trying, but and I bought it, it doesn't go any further. Need more colors in those vertices? Temporis. They're as colorful as I'm ever going to be able to make them. They have every color. <laughs> Happy with this progress today? Looks like the TUI library may be among the living. Nice. Learn more graphics in the last week from me. It's, oh, thank you, Clavinex. So I'm, I was in the middle of explaining that um, one way to, uh, I guess I can recreate the, uh, the issue that I had. What fun? I was in this file, right? Yeah, if I do that, let me show you an amusing bug that, that we had to solve. How's WGP like? You've only ever used OpenGL with Rust? There was a learning curve, definitely. Um, but that didn't illustrate the bug. I think because it's unpredictable. There we go, now we have bills. I just quit the program and started it again and we can see the bug. The cube is being drawn underneath the ground in some places. That's a draw order issue. So in graphics, the general one general problem with graphics is the draw order problem. Um, it gets even more complicated when you have semi-translucent or transparent objects. Um, which do you draw first? And when you have things drawing over other things, does it look realistic? So solid objects, it's pretty easy. You draw the things in the back first, or you have a depth buffer so that you let the fragment shader deal with the problem. So I don't have a depth buffer yet. So the solution I came up with yesterday is I um, arrange all of the things to draw in, in, in batches sorted by draw order. So we have the model and the instances of the model that to be drawn at a certain draw order. We sort them and then we draw them in order, right? So then we always end up getting the cube on top. But sorting all the things you're going to draw can be expensive. And why, why do it in the CPU when you can let the GPU do it? So that's where a depth buffer comes in. Essentially, every pixel will have a value, which is the distance from the camera to that object at that pixel. And using that, the GPU only draws a pixel if there is nothing drawn there yet, or if the things that were drawn there are all um, behind the new object that it's about to draw. 
if something is in front of where you're going to draw, you just drop it. So all the ground pixels behind the cube would not be drawn even if we drew the cube first and we drew the ground on top. You still wouldn't draw the pixels that are overlapping the cube because the ground pixels are behind the cube. Make sense? What's my Linux distro? I should probably make a command for that because um, it's been asked so much, but I'm using Ubuntu 2204.3 LTS on top of Parallels, and the hint for that is the VIRGL, Virtual GL. Uh, Parallels is running on a Mac Studio, so it's 64-bit ARM. I um, was limited to my distros. Uh, the ones that are conveniently pre-built for me, there aren't very many of them compared to um, Intel. So for ARM, I found Ubuntu and uh, Debian. I really wanted to have Linux Mint, but I, I couldn't find a 64-bit ARM build of it. Tried Linux Mint, but I hated it so much. Switch back to Windows. Wow. <laughs> I'm surprised because Linux Mint was one of the ones I loved because it was uh, such a nice, um, it had nice, so I thought it had a nice software updater um, and I didn't have to do much configuration. I just installed and, and it worked, but I guess everyone has a different experience. And your design, what is it? My design, um, I'm just playing around with libraries. So the today command will lead you to other commands that talk about the libraries. I kind of just went over it, so I don't want to like repeat myself. I'm not really um, building any actual production app. I'm more just learning some libraries so that in the future I could use them to maybe build real things. I have never used Gentoo or Alpine. Um, I've used Slackware, Mint, Ubuntu, a little bit of Debian, uh, Red Hat. Before it was called Fedora, it was like the original Red Hat. And that's about it. You use Arch, by the way. I tried to use Arch, but I couldn't get it installed. I use Docker? Yes, I've used Docker. Um, I don't know, can you run graphics in Docker, though? You'd have to have um, emulation of the APIs to talk to the GPU. I'm not sure if Docker lets you do that. And usually when you use Docker, it's all um, headless, um, no UI. But I'm definitely doing UI stuff, so I don't know if that would work with Docker. I'm mostly doing this in parallels to have a nice isolated environment to broadcast that's not my main computer. So then I have, don't have to worry about it like a pop-up window shows my personal information, you'll never see it because I'm never capturing it with OBS. Okay, let me get to um, replacing this sorted batches of drawing uh, with an actual depth buffer. I was in the middle of following this um, tutorial. Here, I'll put the link here if you want to follow along. Uh, this is a great tutorial, in my opinion, for... As the title says up here, learning WGVU, and I'm on the section called the depth buffer. Um, so someone had a question a little bit ago about how WGPU compares to OpenGL. Um, there's a learning curve because in WGP, WGPU, there are actual um, setup steps with types that you don't see in, w, in OpenGL. And those types can be rather complicated. And here's a great example of it. Um, when you um, want to start drawing in OpenGL, you really just say, clear, um, bind this buffer, now draw. In WGPU, you have to say, okay, well, we're going to draw, but first, we need to begin a render pass. Oh, and by the way, um, we can't just say begin a render pass. We have to have a descriptor that describes everything about that render pass um, in general. Um, so in general, like one of the things is what depth buffer are we going to use? Are we going to use one? Okay, yes, we're going to use one. Then describe what that depth buffer, um, what, uh, what we're going to attach basically to the, con to the context of the drawing. And in this case, here's a view into a texture which will store the depth values. And we're going to um, clear it with ones. And we are going to write to it. So there are OpenGL equivalents to these, but they're generally like separate functions. Like there's a function to say that we're going to write to the depth buffer. And there's another function to clear the texture with a certain number, right, to initialize the texture. 
and there's another function to say that we're going to use this particular texture for the death buffer. But in WGPU, um, it's all wrapped up into one descriptor structure and you'd set up in advance. Yeah, so Raymar said it exactly. OpenGL achieves the simplicity by having lots of runtime invalid. So if you do things in the wrong order in OpenGL, you get strange results. WGPU kind of feels more like um, what Rust does with um, borrow checking in that it kind of forces you into a um, much more rigid structure with the benefit of fewer error paths. So it's harder to screw up. And if you do screw up, it's actually pretty clear about what you did wrong in the error message. Same thing with Rust borrow checker, right? The cost is that it's more complicated to learn. Um, it's This is non-trivial. This is very complicated, right? Um, I'm cheating and just copy pasting it, uh, which is fine. In the real world, we do a lot of copy pasting from examples because why type something from scratch and memorize when you can copy it from somewhere else, right? The rule of, of writing it from scratch and using memorization is only when you're in school and that is a trick to get you to um, sort of incorporate some skills without actually practicing them. So like it's kind of like preloading your brain. Once you're in the real world, you end up just doing a lot of copy pasting and then you have a mixture of things that you've memorized because you type them so many times, things that you just you just kind of know the concept of so it's clear you can write some things like maybe um you know that the view is going to be in the depth texture you just know that and other things are like like i'm not going to memorize it i don't type it too often but i know where to get it and so i'm just going to copy paste it from my repository of examples and and that's also called boilerplate yes boilerplate's another word for um largely immutable examples of things that are reused for here and there or th that that mold something to fit a certain interface that's sort of what this is we're molding the fact that we want a depth a certain kind of depth buffer to fit into a render pass okay over explained it that's fine um i forgot how much of this i actually wrote let's look for my render pass okay here it is Okay, so we have no depth stencil attachment. Obviously, we'll want, we want one, so let's just copy this code, right? Why not? Boom, it's done. Okay, so we don't have a view into our depth texture yet. Should it belong with uh, the app? Probably. But I think the way they structured it is they had a structure which had a view in it. I think I'm just gonna collapse it into the depth view. Or maybe just depth texture view. We're going to call it that. We'll do the same thing where we initialize it to one, but we write into it during the render pass. We don't have a stencil. It's a combination of GL bind frame buffer and GL clear. Uh, this isn't a frame buffer, it's a depth buffer. So there's another GL um, bind something. I, 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 or is it that it's called a depth attachment? I forget what it is in OpenGL for a depth buffer, but. Yeah, it's a it's a combination of a few things. You're 18 years old. You've been coding since 15, but no real projects. Only small console apps. Am I too late? No, you're not too late. Have Zer, hello. Um, definitely not too late. Just like uh, Scott B was saying, you could be 53 and still not be too late. Um, I like to think that. No matter how old you are, you can continue learning, and that's one way you can stay happy um, even when you're getting older. Yeah, you have all the time in the world. When you stop learning is when you um, start decaying. That's, that's what I like to think. <laughs> okay, um, I'm kind of mirroring this uh, tutorial, right? So let me, back, let me back up to the start and make sure I did everything that they said. First, they describe their problem. Uh, they're drawing like textured hexagons with trees in them. And they had the same kind of thing where something was drawn in front when it should have been behind. And another case where this kind of snagged and went in front, even though it should be un underneath. So they created the texture at some point. Um, I have not done that yet. 
I don't think. Because I would have seen this extent 3D, and I don't think I have that. Yeah. Well, I can just take my error and um, depth texture view. We can just add that to self. That's not what I wanted. I wanted to go to uh, app over here. Technically, it's inner. Right, and we want to put it here. There. Oh, that's not what I wanted. It's depth texture, right? Texture view. I think that is just called a view. Maybe not. We've created views before, right? Texture view is what it is. Texture view. So we're going to have some texture view, which means we have to create it. So down here, we need to have it. The one thing I like about Rust is that I can just kind of modify in one place and just follow all the errors. And all the errors are kind of pointing where, hey, you need to update this because you changed something else. So here's where we need the uh, depth texture view. And then it says, oh, the error is, well, you don't have it yet. So that means, OK, we have to create it. So I suppose we would create it. Um, somewhere. Uh, I guess it falls under the category of other objects used during frame rendering, right? Unless I package it away somewhere else. 3D models? No. Maybe in here? So I could add another, I could add that. Well, let's just set it up here. So set up our depth buffer. All right, and then why write it from scratch when I can just copy it, right? So that's all of this junk, right? And uh, that depth texture view is where they have the word view. There we go. So let me catch up with chat. Okay, I can't, I can, I can sort of read French, so I can see what you're saying, but I uh, let's try to keep it um, English only, like develop it said, just because it, it's not, uh, it's not that other oh, languages are bad. It's that not all of the moderators understand every language, and so. To moderate, you have to be able to understand what people are saying. Yeah, no, no hard feelings. It's just a limitation of our moderators. Sorry, mods. You don't know every language. Those compiler errors were so helpful. I think so. Did I miss anything? Oh, Tinspin, you got the 3D MMO running on Risk, but it runs at 0.5 FPS. Hey, if it runs, that's a major accomplishment, right? Driver's still not there. Upside is it works. I know. It's cool. Congrats, Tinsman. Okay, we have a width. That's surface config width. Surface config height. Uh, what are we going to put? Some label about um, depth texture. You can start speaking Dutch with Endorn. Hey, if, if we have moderators in chat that know another language, we can certainly open it up to those other languages are okay. As long as you moderators are willing to Keep up with chat and <laughs> make sure that uh, none of the rules are broken. But I just think it's safe to assume English uh, is the only one you that all the moderators know. Okay, need to figure out what the depth format is going to be. Um, these little notes, like the two, are from the tutorial. I don't need them anymore, so I'm going to delete them. Do you think you need to switch from Windows to Ubuntu if you want to learn a Linux environment? No, you can also use uh, Windows on Linux, right? What's it called again? Windows. Linux on Windows? I can't remember the term. Yeah, WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux. So here's something you could use. I think there's a WSL2 now. 
Uh, I haven't actually tried that, but I've heard people like it because you don't have to have a virtual machine. You just have, um, I think it might be kind of like Docker. You could also do a Docker image that has Linux on it and you can host Docker on Windows. Okay, what is this depth format? Oh, they have it defined up here. I thought I copied that before, did I not? And where's find? Where is, where are you find? How come I can't see you? Find all references. Okay, that doesn't really work. I really want to just find. Okay, I put it here. Let's move it out to the app and then we'll have to import it in the renderer. I like to have comments for every constant, so we'll make one now. Uh, this is the uh, GPU texture. This is the GPU texture format uh, we will uh, we use for our depth buffers. Depth buffer. We only need one of it, so I'll just say with uh, for our depth buffer. And I think I'm already importing texture formats, so I think I can drop that part. Or I should be able to just import it. Because it's, I, I like to import things that are non-ambiguous. If there was two things that texture format could mean, depending on library, I wouldn't Im import. But in this case, there's only one kind of texture format, so I'm going to import it. Oh, we don't have a self here, so we have to actually be given it. View. So that means view is ambiguous, right? So this really should be uh, what this calls, whatever this calls. It's like the color attachment view, right? Color. Uh, first things first, let me um, copy paste that so it doesn't have a compiler error anymore. And then I'm going to rename this. So this is like the um, color view, color texture view. Probably the word texture is unnecessary. Actually, let me, so let me remove it from both. The color view and the depth view. So we essentially we have two textures we're drawing into. One is the one we see with our eyes, the color. The other one is recording for the render pass, the depth value so that it doesn't draw incorrectly. Technically, WSL2 is a virtual machine, but you don't have to taff with that side of it. Okay, so it is sort of a virtual, but is it like a true, true, I was going to say true virtual machine, but is it a virtual machine that does like simulation of the machine, of the architecture, or is it just a sandbox environment like Docker? Is there different levels of virtualization, right? So I don't know if WSL is a full like, like a parallels, okay, running Hyper-V. So that is kind of like a sandbox environment, right? Like you're running directly on the CPU with certain traps, like um, that end up going to a simulated kernel of some kind, right? That's my limited understanding of it, which could be wrong. <laughs> okay, so we're attaching the depth view, um, but now we're gonna have a problem where we need to have a depth view when we start a render pass and we don't have it, right? Okay, so it's further um, indirected through another function. So let's update this as well. So we have a color view and we have the depth view. So I'm just doing the lazy approach of following the errors until we get everything to compile. So I'm looking for these little red dots that tell me where to find the errors, by the way. Okay, so view comes from render setup so i bet what we want is render setup to create both views right uh is that what we want do we want to create the view every frame this one only creates the view once at setup time this might be redundant here the fact that we're creating a a color view every frame. 
but maybe it's because we don't know the texture until we ask the surface for it. That's probably why. Probably why. That means the render setup doesn't need to do that. Um, we have the self at this point, so actually we have access to the um, view. So I can just put that directly in here, right? That would be self depth texture view. Okay, I don't like that view is now redundant, or that is now uh, ambiguous. So let's put color view in there. In fact, I might want to chase down into render view and yeah, just to be clear here, color view. It's a view into the colors of the surface, not the depth. All right, so. Were no warnings, no, no errors, but I don't think I ever set up this uh, depth texture view, right? Did I? Yeah, take me there, please. Yeah, this is the problem, right? Oh, no, it's not a problem. I Right, I had copy-pasted this code in here. Got, okay, cool. Um, I think the problem is that we're going to um, only do this once. And so it's only what our surface configuration was. But our surface configuration changes on resize, right? So, hey, let's wait until we actually run to see that bug. <laughs> For now, I kind of would... Um, like to not have a name for size and just fill it in. And description, can't we just inline that too? Put that there. Because it doesn't look too bad. And then give this an actual um, more um, unambiguous name, so depth texture. Okay, so I'm assuming that we can dispose of the depth texture handle because the view handle is persistent. So I'm assuming that this will just work, but let's see. Typ typical way most virtual machine hypervisors work when the host hardware is compatible with the guest OS, right? Yeah, if, if you had two different architectures from the host to the guest, you need to like simulate the guest architecture, right? Okay, so we're getting one of these nice, um, useful error messages from WGPU saying our render pipeline is incorrect. Incompatible depth attachment format. The render path uses a texture with format, some 32-bit depth. The render pipeline uses a texture with no format. Okay, so I need to look at the render pipeline. So we're doing something wrong in the render pipeline. Pipeline? Is that in here? Yes, there it is. Aha. Okay. Where do we set? I guess it's because I didn't set it. Or it's where we set this up. In where? In the new? New here. Right. Getting close. Here it is. Ah, I had written it, but I had commented out because we um, needed the rest of the code for this to work. Okay, there's where I need to import um, the depth format. Okay, it's not going to help me, so... That's because I think I did not make it a public constant, right? Oh, no, it doesn't need to be a public constant. It just needs to be imported several layers up. So, not smart enough to do that. I'll have to do it up here manually. Use create depth format is that oh wait it's in app it needs to move even higher up right into main this might be the wrong choice but i'm gonna do it anyway i'm gonna move it up into main it's just that main really shouldn't care what the depth buffer format is right because i'm going to start importing W, more WGPU stuff that maybe I shouldn't need to. Okay, but that, that 
resolves that error. What's wrong with the app now? It probably needs the import as well. Fixed. Okay, one more error. Or is it a warning? Uh, yeah, it's a warning. Oh. Um, what's going on? Close. I don't know what I did, but it's gone now. Yeah, this import's no longer needed. Okay, zero error, zero warnings. I'd like to see that. Oh, I needed to look and see uh, what my hard deadline is for, like, when my first work meeting is. 9 a.m. Okay, so actually, I have to end a little bit earlier today. Maybe I make up for it by having a, a stream in the evening. Yeah, I got a 9 a.m. meeting, so I have to be out of here at like 8.30. No, I'm still going. It's not 8.30 yet. I got half an hour. Uh, I still have an error. What is it this time? Incompatible. It still says none? Did I just not run this? Wait. The pipeline uses an, a no format attachment still? Did I not save the render? I saved that. Huh. Missing something. No, I'm not I'm not going, Stripe Monkey, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. I'm still here for another half an hour. Pixels depth. Maybe it is because I destroyed the texture. Maybe I'm supposed to hold on to the texture. Just speculating that um, when I made the texture, where did we make that texture again? It wasn't render setup. Wasn't WGP unit. Okay. I'm forgetting already where I'm making things. Is it in new? It was in new. Okay. I'm speculating that I need to hold on to this texture somewhere. So what if I um add it to our state here? By doing that, it means that I will get an error um about this type so I can go to the type and um, click again and I can put it here. It says it's never used, but let's see if that makes the problem go away. I'm gonna guess no. Nope. In a set pipeline command, render pipeline targets are incompatible with render pass. It's the render pipeline has an attachment. Render pipeline. It's this one. I thought I did that correctly. <laughs> Am I missing something there? Modify render pipeline to allow depth testing. Don't forget to store the depth texture. That's what I just did, just in case. I don't know if we need to do that. Yeah, I need I need to do that, but I um I'm not gonna worry about the resize yet. Unless maybe that's the problem. Maybe this is the problem that the size is different, but it said it gave me a different error, right? It told me that it has a format none, so it's the format that's wrong. We did this part. The render pass knows the format. 
Okay, so then... Then I'm kind of lost about what I did wrong. They created a sampler, but I ended up not needing it, right? I reasoned out that I didn't need the sampler. They said here that we, uh, where this sits somewhere here that we don't actually need it, but they used it. Yeah, we technically don't need a sampler for depth texture, but their structure requires it so, and we'll need one if we ever need to sample it, but I, I don't. I don't have that requirement and I don't need it right now. Where is the format set? This doesn't actually, oh, this does set the format. Depth 32 float, so I don't get it. Definition of insanity is doing something twice and expecting different results. That's what I just did, right? Incompatible depth stencil attachment format. Depth stencil attachment format. There's the depth stencil state. The render pass is correct. It has a texture with format some depth 32 fluid. The render pipeline uses an attachment with format none. Oh, do I need to actually attach the buffer to the pipeline when we use it, when we render? That's probably what it is, right? We never set, do we need to set the, no, that's not right. It's the pass that gets the pipeline and the render pass didn't throw an error. It's in the set pipeline command. What's this render pipeline equals eGUI pipeline? Oh, wait, that's the problem. It's in the eGUI stuff. So if I commented out the eGUI stuff, the problem goes away, right? Uh, where would we do that? We did that in the app, right? In the apps, draw. Yeah, if I comment out the eGUI stuff, uh, maybe it works now. And that means that we need to somehow tell eGUI that we have a depth texture. Yeah, okay, that's the problem. The pro So we have a depth buffer here, and I could test that just by drawing the ground on top again, right? So I could just remove the um, sorting that we're doing in the render. No, it's the app when we tell it to draw the models. Yeah, I can just not sort the batches and we won't have the ground clipping the cube problem because the depth buffer will be used. Yeah, but we have to somehow tell the, uh, I'm running this multiple times because I think we get unpredictable order now. So I've run this many times and it never clips the cube. We know that it's using the depth buffer, right? Hopefully. So I can delete all this code, right? I can, um, put it back the way it was. I'll do that later though. Um, I'll keep that for now. To get it back, I have to look at the Git history and see what it was. The real problem is that we, um, the eGUI is not set up in its, um, render pipeline is not setting the uh, format for the depth buffer. Gotta figure out how to do that. Okay, still sort of the draw, yeah, here. When we do draw, when we do start render pass, we set the attachment. And then when we draw our models, um, we use a pipeline that's compatible, but the pipeline that Igu uses is not compatible. So how is that done in here? Okay, problem is this is in an integration library. So how 
we're, we can't change this code, but we can see maybe how they set it up. Okay, they have a self pipeline. There. This is where they create it. So they have a depth stencil. Where do they get it? Depth stencil. You just go oh, there. It is output depth format dot map. Okay, so it comes from a depth format. Okay, so that's given. So when we created it, we had to give a output depth format somewhere. So where did I create it? Created it there. Closing in on the bug. There it is. It's that none right there. Because that is an output depth format. So that's our bug. We have to say some uh, depth format. Now it will work, right? You guys are in chat are still there, right? But the fact of the, the lack of chat doesn't mean that everyone left when they thought I left. <laughs> hey, but hey, look, we fixed it. Um, I'm kind of curious. Does the text draw over the cube now? Well, oh right, we have the problem where resize causes to crash, so I can't resize the window yet. <laughs> You're still here. Oh, thank you. See, that's how I that's how I get chat to to get more to wake up. But you didn't need to unlurk yourselves. It could have just been um, the people who were chatting recently. Thank you for still being here. Um, I need to fix the crash on resize. So I expected this because we're um, not resizing the depth buffer when we resize the color texture, right? Attachments have differing sizes, the depth attached. See, these are nice error messages. Don't you like that? We know where it happened and when, and we know why. It's because the we have a depth attachment has a certain height, but the color attachment has a different, or width and height, the color attachment has a different width and height. It even tells us what they are. Isn't that nice? You prefer GL invalid operation, right? Because then you have the challenge, the, you can enjoy the challenge of trying to figure out what did you do that was invalid. What was the operation and how was it invalid? Two different things you can go like puzzles to solve. And I know I'm just making fun uh, as well. Doesn't this def like, like defeat the purpose of the puzzle? You can't, there's no puzzle to solve. We actually know what we did wrong. <laughs> okay, so um, that means I gotta uh, reuse the code that creates the depth buffer. So right now we're creating it here in new always. Oh, one thing I wanted to test is, do we actually need to persist the depth texture? Like, do I need to do that? What if I don't do that? Will it still work? So we'll just do that. We don't, we don't use it. Do we need to retain it? My guess is that no, the view retains it. The view retains it, so we don't have to. Look at that. All right, so um, I don't need to do that. All we need to do is recreate the view and the review the view retains the texture itself. Right? Cool. I like that. So um then it's much easier. There's only one handle to it. So let's refactor this. Okay, I think I can see one problem we're gonna have is that if we're recreating the view. Um, let me not get ahead of myself. I think I'm going to run into a problem with moving something in and out of the state. But let's see what happens. So refactor function uh, create depth texture view. I didn't know what that type is, so that's a surface configuration. Probably need to import it. No, it just knew. It just didn't know it. 
Okay, and so this, we don't need the let. We don't need the name. Just remove the semicolon and we're done, right? And um, why make a name only to call that? We can just chain it. So it's just that without the semicolon, without the name. Look at that. So it's a, it's a builder pattern. So from the device, we create a texture. From the texture, we create a view. And that's what we return. Whoops. That. Uh, it lost where I was. Oh, because I didn't change the name correctly. I broke the association, so they're fixed. Okay, so I just need to call that again. Let's put in the comment here, set up our initial depth buffer. Um, this will need to be recreated every time of the surface configuration changes. E G I E. I always get I E and E G mixed up. I think it would be um E G, right? For example, instead of in other words, for example, the window is resized. That's one way our surface config can change. All right, so let's go to where it can be changed. So in resize, right here. So recreate our depth buffer to match oh, as um, uh, to keep to keep it compatible with uh, our surface. Thing is, can I do a self dot that? Does that actually work? Oh, it just just does work. Okay, cool. I was worried about having um, an issue with Rust um, replacing some part of self, but I guess we're allowed to do that. Okay, can I resize now? Ooh, look, I can resize. Okay, so the text does show up on top of everything. I wonder if, is that always true? Or can eGUI's depth be set? Okay, I got like 17 minutes. According to Grammarly, eg is for example, i is in other words. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to remember. Like the e is example and i is in other words. I'm kind of pedantic, uh, well, not pedantic is the wrong word. Um, I, I kind of have a pet peeve for using incorrect grammar or terminology. I try to use it correctly. Good point to check everything in, right? So stage everything, get commit. And yes, I use the GUI to stage and the command line to commit. Don't hate me. So what would we do? Add depth buffer. And just because I can do it, I'm going to send it out of the virtual machine. So I have a backup copy. All right. Cool. So we have the depth, we have a depth buffer now. What do I want to do next? Oh, there was another bug I wanted to fix here. I think I saw it the other day um, when I removed the spinner. We get we, a bug happens. This is sort of a fun one. Um, let's to remove the spinner. I go to the overlay. Oh, that reminds me of something else I want to do. The overlay is not owned by the right thing right now. But anyway, let's say I comment out the spinner. Right? You'd expect that this the only thing that would change would be the spinner would be gone. Right? But that's, no, that's not what happens. Look what happens. Our animation stopped. But if I move the mouse, it starts again. Stop the mouse, it stops. Why is that? It's because eGUI is no longer telling me 
or tell the ego is no longer telling the the event loop that it needs to redraw every frame. So um, fundamentally, it's because the cube is also an animation. So what I need to have in place is both eGUI and my models should be able to ask for a redraw. Right now, only eGUI asks for redraws. And it worked as long as it constantly would needed to animate the spinner. But as soon as we um, no, no, don't have an animation anymore, nothing is asking for a redraw, and so we never get one. So um, let's update our code so that the, the cube itself can request a redraw. Um, that would be um, back in our app where we draw the models. Why don't we um, have it return a duration just like the eGUI does, right? So in draw, eGUI renderer can get a duration, right? I guess it's buried inside here somewhere. Oh, that's their render. Uh, shoot, where where is the? It's not in the render, right? It's in um, the redraw itself, where we process something, right? At the end here, it's in eGUI's full output. There's a repaint after. If duration is zero, eGUI is requesting immediate repaint. If it's greater than zero, eGUI wants to be repainted at or before a certain duration elapses, right? So I want the same thing for my um, model stuff. So this comes out of redraw. Part of redraw is self draw. So if this, if we want draw itself, we want draw itself to return a duration. And that duration is going to come from this draw models, right? So we'll have I wonder if I can flip the order of these, but let's first keep it in the same order. So we'll say like model models redraw request equals. That's a terrible name, but we'll go with it for now. So in draw models, do we want each individual um, model to do it? Kind of, because here's where the rotation is applied, right? Oh no, it's we don't we don't set the rotation here. Where do I set the rotation? Maybe this isn't the right spot. Draw, redraw. Where do I set the rotation? Oh, here it is. That's where I do it. Okay. If that's where we do it, then that's really where the redraw should originate. So it shouldn't come from draw. So undo that. Draw model of oh, this it no longer returns anything. We don't return that. Draw models doesn't return a duration anymore. It's just drawing, right? It's, I think I need to refactor um, this part here. This is like models update. Just like there's an update eGUI or um, what do they call it? Process, I call it process, they called it run. There's like, there's a run on the context that gives us back Output and part of the output is this repaint after, right? So I kind of want a, a similar thing for my own stuff. So do I call it run like they called it run? And what is the thing? It's just self models, I guess. That's a hash map of hodgepodge of things. Maybe I may, maybe I make that more formal. So they don't have to have a hash map exposed this way. How is this used? We iterate through it and draw models. Yeah, but we could also just make it expose the iterate protocol. Really, I should do it that way anyway. Oh, there's one place I don't need any code there.
This I'm reaching in to grab the first cube, right? Ten minutes, do I have enough time to do this? I can at least fix the problem and then we'll refactor it later. To do needs uh, refactoring. Uh, we should move the responsibility really of updating our models and determining a draw time. Read draw. What does the e GUI call it again? I keep forgetting. It's in this full output. Repaint after. Repaint after. Remember the words. Repaint after. Determine a repaint after. Value. We should move the responsibility of updating our models and determining a, a repaint after value. To some new object. Or perhaps the models object. Right now, it's not an object, it's a hash map. Let's say um, perhaps encapsulating the model's value. Yeah, so right now we're not doing that. We're going to just um, hard code it. So assuming we always want to animate, then we'll just set re, um, repaint after to some um, duration. What do we want to set? Doesn't um, I can just make some arbitrary duration, like like let's say a hundred milliseconds. It's not as millis, it's um, just millis, right? From millis. From milliseconds, right? Okay, and then that repaint after has to be kind of merged with Igui's repaint after. So it's gonna be like whichever happens first. So can I do in the minimum? Yeah, min with repaint after. I should probably make that non, I should make that unambiguous, right? So this is like models repaint after. So then we're returning the minimum repaint after from eGUI and the models. Let's have a uh, comment about that. Repaint after, um, repaint when either eGUI or our models wants a repaint, whichever happens first. There we go. So let's see if that fixed is, fixes it. Fixed it is it. So I picked the hundred sort of on purpose because I wanted to show that like the cube wants to be drawn at 10 FPS. 100 milliseconds per update, right? EGUI, when it's animating, wants to go much faster, in this case, 90 FPS. So the cube looks like more smoothly animated. If I don't move the mouse, I don't know how well this will come across on Twitch, but you can see the FPS number is 10. Uh, if I don't um, move the mouse, it settles back to around 10, 9.5, I guess. And that's because what's driving the repaint now is just the cube model. But if I start like, animating the UI by moving the mouse around on it, it requests more repaints. So I like this. It, it's sort of um, allowing the elements of the view dictate like when it needs to be repainted. And if we don't need to be repainted, we don't waste time redrawing, right? And if I were to like remove the model, uh, the cube, and it no longer animates or something, then we wouldn't redraw, which is gonna be important later when I put in the physics engine. And if the physics engine says, this cube didn't move, then we don't need to redraw. But if it did move, we want to redraw right away, right? Or at the next um, at the next interval, I guess. Let me make sure the redraw right away works. 
the way that it's supposed to work is we should be able to say like duration zero here. And it doesn't, it shouldn't draw immediately, it should be frame rate capped to 60. If I did this right. Do I use wnit? That's one of my two backends. And look, it worked. So it's capped at 60 for um, if it's just the models driving it. Yeah, so way back in in our main program, um, we get to pick from two different backends and one of them is W in it. The other one's full tick. Conceivably, I could add an SDL also as a third option. So it has to be able to implement my abstraction, which is you need to be able to create a WGPU surface from it given a WGPU instance. So there has to be some WGU integration library. It has to be able to uh, run an event loop and has to be able to tell us the size of our window. And it has to, um, right now, um, host an eGUI context and an integration layer, which knows how to obtain eGUI input. So those are the requirements. So if SDL can do all of that, then sure. The one thing I would do if I wanted to try SDL with WGPU and eGUI is I have to look for um, integration libraries. So let's see, is there an eGUI SDL? Oh, so there's an eGUI SDL2. I don't know what the difference is between SDL and SDL2, but there we go. There's also an eGUI window SDL2. And then is there an WGPU SDL? Okay, I don't know, but that just jumped to SDL2. Okay, SDL2 uses WGPU as a development dependency. I don't know if that means they support WGPU in inherently or not. But maybe it might be SDL WGPU. We could also look at WGPU and um, see if they list an integration layer as... Um, in their list. Uh, where is that listed? On their homepage, maybe? Or would it be SDL's homepage? So there has to be some way to um, integrate between SDL and WGPU for, for me to be able to make a backend for it. SDL2, okay, yeah. So for... Um, W init, it was um, oh, I remember how this works. The integration between W init and WGPU is that um, you can ask the W init to um, return a raw window handle that because create surface requires something that implements a raw window handle and a raw display handle, right? So as long as like SDL's window also implements raw window handle traits, that's the thing. So we'd have to look at SDL and does its SDL windows um, type implement raw window handles traits? If so, then we can use it um, in create surface. So that's the only point of integration between like the window backend and WGPU. The more complicated one is eGUI, and we saw that there's already an integration library for that. Those traits from a third party, third library, yeah, it was um, raw window handle. Raw window handle. So I could look and see um, if W, if uh, SDL2 supports raw window handle. Yep, it's an optional dependency. I don't know um, how that works. Feature raw window handle. Enables raw window handle. So there you go. So if we used SDL and turn on the feature raw window handle, it would work. Yeah. So maybe that's an, 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 a cool thing I could do to further expand my uh, playground here is in main, we could add a third implementation SDL to or SDL. I don't know, just do people usually put the two there? or just keep it SDL. I'll keep it there for now. Maybe I'll put a to-do. 
might be fun to get this running in SDL2. There we go. Write SDL2 just to disambiguate? Okay. I did a little bit of the full tick, but it's not complete. So if I do cargo run full tick, um, I think the problem with that was I was not, um, I didn't completely integrate eGUI to it. So, um, so the window events cause a retraw, but eGUI doesn't get any of those events. So the button doesn't work here. Yeah, and obviously we can see the event loop doesn't um, use the model's uh, re repaint after. Or I could say, I should turn around and say the repaint after isn't honored by full tick, the full tick event loop. Probably because I just didn't write that. Take a look. I'm wrapping up the stream anyway, so we're just kind of exploring. What did I do in the event loop here? Okay, so I set up the resize callback and um, I guess we're just always redrawing every time we get an event. Yeah, so we're just always redrawing. So we have to have an event in order to redraw. And um, redraw returns a duration, and we're discarding it. We're not using it at all. So I guess to complete this, what we'd have to do is we'd have to re use that return duration and set a idle timer or idle callback in full tick, which would cause... Um, an event, right? And we should probably only redraw when we're supposed to redraw, not every single time. <laughs> you have some 60 hertz limit? I do have a limit. Um, I did that, I think here somewhere? Yes. I have a limiter here of one over the max draw rate or the draw time. So it's the, um, Oh, where is it exactly? Is that it? I think that's it. But max makes me think it's the other way around. Oh, right, because it's the greater of the two and this is the smallest number it can be. So if the repaint after is like zero, it's not going to repaint immediately. It's going to at least wait that much time. And that much time is 60 hertz. So if I turn that to like 120 and I um, ran WNIT again, it should go up to 120 FPS or as fast as it can to approach that. I think maybe we can't draw that fast. Okay, so there's some bottleneck at around 82. <laughs> So we're we're being throttled by something else. Probably that render time, right? I bet if you did one over that frame rate, you get that re render time. So it'd be interesting to see what's taking up nine milliseconds. I'm gonna guess it's eGUI, is sort of, or maybe the way I'm using eGUI. I'm doing something inefficient. Maybe because it's a debug build. What if we do a release build? Or maybe because it's in the virtual machine. Maybe outside the virtual machine, it would be faster. No matter how you do it, you either get a duplicate frame every 100-ish frames or too high input latency. How to correctly do this sort of frame timing stuff. Well, I'm working within the framework of... Um, sorry. I was speaking faster than I could navigate. I'm working within the framework of these repaint after numbers that come out of my redraw, right? So it's like a request that like, after you're done drawing, could you please draw again after a certain time duration? And then I just simply to do a frame limit cap, I say, well, um, make it at least this amount of time from the last time we, we drew. And then I had, I had a little bit more of logic here because of, um, that we could redraw early, right? This is to prevent drawing like too fast. Update our draw time only if the no next draw time actually arrived. Otherwise we redrew for some re other reason other than the timer. So uh, maybe you're running into a similar issue where um, 
you might be drawing because a timer expired or something else happened. And if it's that something else happened, you, you don't want to do the same logic as the timer expiration because otherwise you'll start drawing too fast. Um, what happens is this control flow set wait until with W in it um, causes this uh, new event resume time reach to happen after that time is, ha has, after that time instant arrives. So we give it a absolute time, I think. We say when this time arrives, we want to um, reach a resume time, and then we just request a redraw at that point. So it's going to be different for SDL or full tick, right? I think in full tick, you set an idle callback or something like that, or you set a time call, some kind of callback. You say, I want to be called, I want an event to be happen to happen after a certain amount of time. Ultimately, since it's an event loop, what you want is you want an event to be generated at or bef right before you plan to redraw. So you currently use W in it. So yeah, you want to set this control flow set wait until to um, the moment that you want the next frame to be drawn at. And then rather than drawing it when that event arrives, I think the polite thing to do is to request a redraw immediately. You get another one back out. But I could be wrong about that. Maybe we should be redrawing here and not requesting a redraw. I don't know. Anyway, I think that's about it for me. Uh, I should leave you guys with, where is it? There, there's what we accomplished today. And that's as fast as we can draw, 90 frames per second. How come my following list is completely empty? Is is there really no one I'm following currently streaming? That's sad. Okay, so then if I browse like software and game development, like, is there anything, anyone interesting? I develop things, custom interpreted DSL language in Go. That sounds cool. Someone's making a 2D survival game in Godot. Uh, and they have a webcam. Don't know this person, but I can actually read their text and I can see them. So why don't we raid them? I have to type their name though. There we go. We're going to raid Jackie Codes. Actual readable text, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll be back tomorrow. Hope you guys stay well. And I will see you later, okay? Bye!